here. Woo! Ready. How do you want to start? Uh, hello, everybody. Hey, everyone. I was waiting for you to do oh, the okay. intro, but I can do it. Do you want? Oh, here. Um, all right. All right. You want it? You, you want to do it? You can you can start it actually. No, you no, you do start it. it. Yeah. Alright. Hello everyone. I'm Isaac. And I'm Corey. And this is about movies with Isaac and Corey. <laughs> That's are... actually not the name. It's Corey and Isaac. Well we're retitling it though, <laughs> because I'm gonna say our names in the intros from now on and it has to the order okay. has to match. So. No, alphabetical always, dude. Um our last uh oh, <laughs> last name. You got me there. Too. <laughs> Double, right. double C. Well, we'll finish this conversation when we're not uh, live. <laughs> when we're not alive? No, what? live. We're not oh, alive. Not, not alive. Okay. We're not alive. Sounds good. I'll see you in hell. <laughs> Getting uh, crazy. Okay. Today we're going to do a free form kind of show, talk about a lot of different movies. We uh, we're talking about pretty much a broad overview of the movies we saw in 2019, focusing on a little project that we've been doing where we ranked all of the movies that we watch and then we took the top 20 and that's what we're going to talk about today yes indeed it is nearing the end of january 2020 now but we are still hanging on to our memories of 2019 because not too much has come out yet in 2020 yeah cinematically to grab our attention in fact i actually haven't yet seen a single movie that was officially released theatrically in 2020. Yeah, unless you count 1917, which I think we're counting as 2019. Yes. Well, the thing is, the reason we're doing this episode now is because the Oscars are less less, they, less when this episode comes You're out. You're right, yeah. <laughs> when this episode comes out, the Oscars will be just about a week away. And after this episode, we will move on, stop looking back on the past like some... Yeah. Past nostalgic lookers. yeah <laughs> past lookers <laughs> exactly and uh boldly forge ahead like yeah. picard in the new cbs all access series star trek picard <laughs> after the oscar ceremony really is when movies start coming out again the bigger releases yes. so far all we've had is like bad boys for life <laughs> Just Mercy, which came out kind of in 2019. That was another 2019. Yeah. Awards um, contender. So. Yeah, exactly. What else? Oh, The Gentleman. So that's pretty right. much it in terms and of like the biggest releases. Hopefully we'll get to The Gentleman this weekend. Tonight we are Ooh. seeing the new Nicolas Cage starring Lovecraft adaptation, The Color Out of Space. Which has surprisingly good reviews, which yeah. is awesome. Directed by Richard Stanley, who has this really weird filmography. I'm not sure if you know his name no. I, I didn't until i googled it yesterday but he made these like weird 90s uh cyberpunk horror ish movies one of them is about like a killer robot dog and he hasn't released a movie or worked on one in like 15 years <laughs> and then he came back to make this wow well maybe it's a big project for him getting nicholas cage that's a big deal that's a huge deal yeah we're trying to get nicholas cage on here but yeah he ha he's only responded to a couple emails so far, so we'll see where that goes. Yeah, I am still texting him every day, <laughs> begging him. Anyways. Shall we get to the big topic at hand? Yes, everyone's been wondering. We've had thousands of emails and comments, our opinions on the Best Picture nominees, because that's always a heated point. Uh, we've seen a couple articles out already that basically you know, talk about the usual scenario that the Academy is all outdated and they are not in touch with everything and they're just picking the biggest movies that get the most attention and not actually based on like the quality. Yeah, so. and also not concerned with the representation of a diverse collection of different kinds of movies, right? right. I think that maybe is uh, the biggest problem with the Oscars. It's not that they nominate popular movies. In fact... Some people would argue they don't do that enough. They neglect the most popular movies in the world, like this entire superhero genre, mm. for instance, right? It's a big point of discussion that Joker is the first comic book movie to get nominated for Best Picture. So that's the kind of new ground that the Oscars are breaking right now. They are possibly about to declare their first comic book film Best Picture winner ever, but still there is one person of color nominee in all four acting categories. Yeah, you can almost anticipate what each nominee what each nominee is going to be nominee nominee 
even with there being nine contenders for Best Picture, the list is pretty unsurprising in every way. Most of the highest profile ones that are primarily white people and did well critically, did well financially, kind of the ones that appeal to the most classic, I guess, film techniques as well. Mm -hmm. We talked about already just before this, Uncut Gems was massively snubbed, possibly due to just how different it was and Un- alienating yeah exactly unwelcoming in its viewing experience yes yeah. and there are exceptions to this homogeneousness of the nominees right we saw a south korean film nominated for best picture parasite it was mm. an extremely popular and magnitudes more financially successful than most south korean films are in america so it's not like they went out of their way to choose yeah. some <laughs> off the beaten track foreign film but nonetheless South Korean yeah. film nominated for Best Picture, and it's a great film. We also have a woman director whose film is nominated for Best Picture, but she was snubbed for the Best Director Award. Yeah, yeah. So it's this whole kind of small flashes of <laughs> diversity that are greatly overshadowed by the overall shying away from that, right? Yeah, or at least not showing any blatant concern for it right maybe the epitome of that in terms of the nominees would be ford versus ferrari Mm -hmm. which is not a bad movie it didn't make it onto either of our top 20s as we're i actually didn't see it Corey didn't see it which made it hard for it to get into his top 20 ford versus ferrari is such a stereotypically white male appealing film that it is almost comical. I liked the movie. I am a white man, but <laughs> I'm not a racing fan. And it's well constructed. It's well written. The two leads are obviously great. The racing sequences are actually pretty memorable and tense and really well choreographed, actually. Like, I think you will like it when you see it, Corey. Okay. But it is also such a straightforward biopic about sports awards grabby type movie and hey it grabbed a best picture nomination surprise surprise although interestingly you ranked it above once upon a time in hollywood on your top Mm. list on letterboxd yeah i did i did it might be a bit of recency bias there it's hard for me rankings are so hard we were talking about this right before we started the episode Mm. you just feel like you're shuffling them around kind of arbitrarily at a certain point but yeah i did and that was a surprising one for me considering i enjoy tarantino's films a lot usually yeah we already had an episode dedicated to discussing once upon a time in hollywood so we won't delve into it too deep here but check that one out definitely i did put that one on my top 20 as number 12 so i thought that that was a solid one Mm. one that i didn't include on mine that isaac did very high on his list was jojo rabbit which we have yet to talk about on the podcast yeah taika waititi's controversial hitler youth themed Wes Anderson light comedy, (laughs) which might make it sound like I didn't like it, but I actually loved it for all the criticism of it that I've read that I found to be very interesting by people talking about how it just does not treat the subject matter with enough reverence and isn't maybe justified in its setting. And it doesn't bring enough in terms of unique critique of society to warrant the fact that it comically portrays Hitler and all that stuff. Uh, Despite all of those criticisms that you read, I loved the movie. It hit me in the feels, for one. And I'm not a huge fan of Waititi's prior films, so it caught me a little bit off guard how constantly I was laughing and how much that laughter ended up making me think after the fact. Okay. I just thought that it was a really joyous movie experience for me, ultimately, even though it is so dark and potentially problematic, I guess. Mm. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed it, but the reason why I didn't include it high up on my list anywhere is just because it didn't strike me the same way as a lot of these other movies. Like, I get really emotionally invested in movies usually that I like, and the nature of a comedy, it can be more surface level than maybe a drama, Mm. which is definitely an overstatement because there's a lot of good depth and a lot of good stuff. 
in Jojo Rabbit, and it's coming from a really good source material that I haven't read, but I've heard it's good. There's a lot that I liked about it, and honestly enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would, given all of the circumstances. But there was something about it that just didn't give me the same feel. Like, spoiler alert, outside of the podcast, we talked about the mom death scene, where it kind of just shows Scarlett Johansson hanging in town square, and he just stumbles upon it, which was a very sudden shift and worked very well. Yeah, but, that really was when the movie was elevated for me. Like, yeah, and despite a couple of those like good moments that really grabbed me, I felt like there was an overall good idea there that just didn't quite grip me the same way as I think the people that really liked it did. Mm. And I, honestly, I kind of feel the same way about the criticism. Like, I don't think that it's irreverent in a way that like is making fun of it, obviously, because that'd be horrible. And it's definitely not a poorly made film. I just wouldn't quite put it in the same place as the others, I mm-hmm. think. I am, think it's really interesting that this one got nominated for Best Picture just because it was kind of a financial failure and mm-hmm. it was pretty divisive, you know, not universally acclaimed by either critics or audiences. True. It's also uh, won some awards, though, already. It so It had that um, kind of hype behind it. But I think it's interesting that a movie like this gets nominated at this moment that we're at in the world right with the rise of all of these populist right-wing political groups to power throughout all of the world we see this movie get nominated that is maybe the perfect example of how unsure we are as like a whole society about what to do about all of this this fervorous hatred that is rising all around the world how do we handle this topic how do we address it it's like the ultimate anxiety of our times if you're like a liberal leaning person and hollywood considers itself to be a liberal leaning person regardless of whether that is disingenuous so it is like a superficially liberal movie that's gotten a lot of flack for actually being really traditional and having things like the Nazi with a heart of gold, Sam Rockwell's character, Mm. and just all of it kind of boiling down to it not treating its subject matter. Yeah, and maybe the overall lightness of the movie. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff in there about how well the brainwashing worked, Mm -hmm. right? From the ideology of Nazism. That's why, for me, it didn't come across as trivializing that issue in the same way. Mm -hmm. Like, I've seen some criticisms of it characterize that kind of humor that it uses a lot as just kind of being like a, ha-ha, look how dumb and goofy, like, Nazis were. Like, can you believe anyone ever thought this? And that is not the vibe that I got. (laughs) The vibe. That is really just not the effect that that humor had for me. It felt more like an acknowledgement like you just said of how effective those techniques are for Mm. getting massive amounts of people to think in a certain way and it treated the people within that world as pretty typical movie characters who just happened to exist in nazi germany and they had this disconnect right this like one huge thing where everyone was complacent and went along with this horrific thing that happened But they also were just humans, ultimately, right? Like, they were people. And so this movie completely and almost comically exaggerates that brainwashing aspect and that complacence of the German people, Mm -hmm. while also turning them into really interesting and lovable characters who you can acknowledge and see as human beings and it kind of forces you to grapple with that in a very direct way through its comedy which just makes plain yeah that aspect so anyway and at the same time yeah i can totally see that as feeling irreverent just because any form of treating that aspect of the holocaust as comical can be offensive like, mm-hmm. so you know i can see both sides of it i'm not sure exactly where to stand on it yeah. and whether the movie is like politically correct or not right right yeah i mean reading those criticisms has definitely made me at least reevaluate where i stand on that and i guess i don't fully know either but i've just decided to come down on it the way that i my gut reaction was yeah your enjoyment of it yeah i haven't rewatched it since so maybe i should same nonetheless Um, it was in my top five movies of the year and it was not in yours it was not in my top 20 
So we already talked about on the podcast, Parasite, Marriage Story, Irishman. We both put those on our top 10, I mm-hmm. think, right? Yeah, and then we just touched on Ford Ferrari a little bit mm-hmm. and kind of mentioned Joker, but we'll probably come back to that one. Uh, the one we just saw was 1917, which you put on your top 20. And I kind of am landing still on that it is a technical marvel, but didn't quite have the full story elements that put it over the line for like into the top 20. Like I still think it's kind of right below where I would consider top 20, Mm. but it was missing that extra push, that extra oomph. (laughs) And maybe it's because of the gimmick you know, the one shot thing. Although I actually really enjoyed that. I thought, you know, it's technically so amazing and the choreography that went into it was probably astounding, but just enough kind of like in Jojo Rabbit, enough small details that took me out of it a little bit and Mm -hmm. proved that it was a movie and not, (laughs) you know, a gripping experience. Yeah. But I enjoyed it a lot. I overall agree with that evaluation. I'm kind of curious what details you're thinking of when you call it kind of a movie experience Mm -hmm. um so i'd like to come back to that in a second but first i just want to touch upon something else you said which was the one shot aspect and that i agree i'm thinking maybe in 15 years the one shot movie will be this tired trope that is just i think so too i think so too acknowledged universally as a gimmick and as much as i've seen some criticism leveled at 1917 in that regard i just can't relate (laughs) i'm still at the point where it's really cool (laughs) like i've never seen you know, there's only a I, few. Yeah, it's incredible to see. The list of films that has done this is astoundingly small. Like, Wikipedia has a list, and it is, like, 12 movies mm-hmm. um, that have been edited to appear as one shot. Right, of um, course. And only, like, a few that have legitimately been one shot, but that's a whole other story. Yeah, that's um, that's on a totally different level. Right. But, the, but still, even the editing to look like one shot, like 1917, is still a technical marvel. Yes, it really is. It is incredibly absorbing those initial shots when they're just walking through the trenches and the camera is backing up and they're walking mm-hmm. towards it were so absorbing even though it yeah was it was just, paced really interestingly it was i liked the real time aspect at the beginning there where you really just you were entered their life at this random moment where they got chosen to do this task and then you were just right there along with them every moment of the way for basically the entire first half of the movie mm-hmm. and that was my personal favorite part of the movie was that first half and then should we spoil it yeah okay. we always spoil it right and then it gets to that point where blake dean charles chapman's character dies in what is one of the most heart-wrenching death scenes that i have experienced in the movie theater for quite a while it just forces you to linger and it dwells on it for so long without pulling away in any way visually yeah, right or there. otherwise and he's talking like he's experiencing his own death. It's just so raw and unfiltered. I still don't know how in one shot they really made it look like he died. Like he just turned so pale and limp that it was choreography wise incredible. It was. And then there were other parts of the movie that were incredible choreography wise, like the plane crash scene we already have talked about before this podcast. But I'm curious where you landed on that because that kind of relates to what you were saying before i know that was one of my criticisms i of it. still like the plane crash part a lot just from a technical standpoint but you know i can't help but feel the like overarching movie effect that's going on right the feeling that he wasn't really traveling a large distance because we're with him the whole time and it only takes two hours or so mm-hmm. to get to the destination so the fact that it's not edited makes you feel like you're not going a very far distance And they do a pretty good job with that in the beginning, especially, right? Like you said, the walking through the trenches and then the very silent going through the no man's land, too, is also just like really cool and feels very real time. But I think from there onward, every other aspect felt like it was a lot shorter than it should have been. Mm. Yeah, I actually agree with that assessment. Definitely. And it's just like part... part of the nature of the one shot take. That is an interesting, it's definitely the passage of time, you know, becomes a difficult question of how do you handle that mm-hmm. with the one take movies. Birdman did it by having those time lapse scenes out on the, you yeah, know, that the sky, really, really did really feel effective. like real time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And 1917 didn't quite know how to handle that sense of time as well. I agree that in the first part, it 
worked really well because you really got the sense that even though they weren't traveling an immense physical distance, the arduousness of their journey was still astounding. Yeah. And you bought into that, right? No Man's Land wasn't an enormous place. It was a big place, but it was, you know, a matter of hundreds yeah. of feet, not hundreds of miles. And also, we already talked about this outside the podcast too, but the city scene is definitely the worst part of the movie. Yeah. I think because he immediately enters the city and he's a hundred yards from where he got dropped off, right? right? He walked over to a bridge and started walking across, immediately starts getting shot at. Right. Right Nobody after else. he gets yeah, off exactly. the convoy. Right after he gets dropped off there. Yeah. And then after he gets shot, he wakes up. Which, let's talk about that. It's actually not a one-shot. <laughs> it's two shots, Straight up yeah. cuts to black at that point, <laughs> and you're not first person. There's no excuse here. It's two shots. Yeah. Zero out of ten. Zero out of ten. Anyway, um, but anyway, then the whole travel through the city scene, he's going through a yeah. whole city in a matter of minutes. Yeah, and we were talking about coming out of the theater. Visually, it's a little puzzling. I think the intention was definitely to light it realistically with flares and other sources of light that conceivably would have been there. The Honestly, result... I think that it was I think it was fake lighting and that's why it didn't look right. Like, yeah. I don't think they actually used flares. I think they just used sound effects and real and light. Yes. Like studio lighting. Yeah. I don't want to come down definitively on that just because I don't know lighting well enough. But regardless, I thought the effect when I was just sitting there in the theater looking at it is it looked kind of washed out and fake. It looked like he was standing on a set. It was one of the few parts of the movie where it just looked like he was on an elaborately built set, mm -hmm. which is probably where he was. <laughs> I think so. I don't think it was big enough to be a whole city. Yeah. Right? I so either. I think it conceivably was enough ruins looking things built for mm -hmm. that set the city scene also includes the scene where he meets the french exactly. girl in the so basement i'm encompassing this whole part yeah. yeah really funny scene also very problematic i think it's this incredibly conventional it's like a masculine fantasy basically right he stumbles into this <laughs> yeah. basement where he happens to hide fleeing from a german soldier he goes through this window and lo the and behold, only woman in the movie yeah is there yeah <laughs> straight up the only woman in the movie is there she happens to be like a young beautiful french girl his age oh and she has a baby it's yeah not an adorable baby, but... beautiful baby that she just found perfectly right. healthy and happy and she tends his wounds and he gives her him. milk and yeah he has food. milk for the baby hilarious coincidence <laughs> <laughs> she you know she doesn't want him to go like right down to that don't go at the end, I, just that whole scene felt like it was way too convenient, totally unnecessary, and legitimately shit gender politics. Yeah. Uh, so what made you put it on the top 20 then? Oh, well, I still loved the first half. And despite a few other conveniences in the plot, like the plane being one of them with the fact that that crashes right on them in what is probably the most explicit blockbuster set piece moment... <laughs> I still just am marveled at how they even did that. It was crazy visually, but just in terms of it feeling like it was these two soldiers kind of clawing their way through the horrors, the muddiness of trench warfare, that felt like a little bit too of a big <clears throat> bombastic. Yeah, it uh, felt like a big plot device in order to kill off Blake too. Like they needed yeah. to show a German dude that they rescue from certain horrible death. Right. That then goes and immediately stabs him to death. Yeah, we don't exactly <laughs> get a well-rounded portrait of the German psyche in this movie. They're pretty yeah. much all just trying to kill the shit out of the main characters. That's okay. Anyways, though, I was going to say the one other part that I thought was kind of dumb was the river part where he goes down the waterfall and like he <laughs> survives going through the rapids, getting chucked down a huge waterfall, and he like floats idyllically as if he's some kind of religious figure surrounded by rose petals and, like, lands on the shore. Fucking, although the dead bodies. Although there's dead bodies. Yeah. But that also felt almost comically grotesque. I'm sure it was accurate, actually, but it was just, like, came right after this yeah. really idyllic convenient, scene, yeah. weird, idyllic scene, which I guess was probably an intentional contrast. I think it started ramping up, though, towards the end. Totally. Right. The Starting finale. there, it started ramping up again. Yeah, that song scene is really striking as the camera just drifts yeah. through the soldiers as they're sitting still. And then the whole finale is, of course, a ludicrous technical <laughs> Yeah, I seriously, they... unbelievable. Yeah. So that's why I did it. It's because even though I have all these criticisms of it, the conveniences of the plot, you know, the problematic aspects, the technical imperfections, 
what 1917 still ultimately added up to for me was uh, one of the coolest theater experiences I've had in a long time because that's just fair. how it's striking essential it was. theater viewing for sure. Yeah, and it does I think have some really striking moments that revealingly peek in at this really horrific moment in history where these young men were asked to live in the conditions that they lived in and do what they did. Valid. Yeah. Let's yeah. end this part of the topic sure. with a movie that's better than 1917 and that is Little Women. Yes. Which is another just barely popped in at the end of 2019 to God, get yeah. nominated. So glad it was nominated for an Oscar. A couple. A couple. Yes. Yeah. For so actress, shitty that Gerwig didn't get whatnot. nominated for her direction, yeah. considering how inventive her. <clears throat> I know, incredible uh, restructuring of the story is. I couldn't. I could hardly even believe how she treats it. Like, okay, you know what's going to happen at the end. You know where this is going to end up. So basically starting it at both points, right? Both Mm -hmm. the beginning and the middle half of the movie. Right. And editing it that way so that you kind of see both sides of the story at once. And it's almost told in flashbacks a little bit. And it just gets this great picture of like their destitute post childhood lives and the more idyllic time when they were all together those contrasts were just so incredible. They were. And you know what? I want to reference one of our past podcast episodes real quick because I think that this is an example of the art of adaptation at its very finest. Definitely. Um, we talked about this in our King of Adaptation two-part episode. <laughs> but in this case, we're not adapting a horror novel, of course. But still, this is an artist, Greta Gerwig in this case, taking source material that is acclaimed and acknowledged as great and turning it into a film that respects its source material, but feels like something completely new and different. I mean, it just tells maybe the same story, but finds a completely new way to tell it that somehow feels like it was the right way to tell it all along. Exactly. Like, because of the conventions of Alcott's time, you could only tell the story from beginning to end, right? It would have been very, very unusual to do it any other way. So, at the same time, she also recognized the book as two separate parts. Yeah. Right? The little women and the wives aspect. So, uh, seeing those at the same time was a very good modern convention that told both stories in a very excitingly edited way. Yeah. And not that it's anything revolutionary in 2019 to have made a film that is non-chronological and jumps back and forth in time a lot it's just the execution is so spot on part of the achievement is Greta Gerwig seeing the potential of this story to be told in this different way and then part of it is just her incredible command of all of the characters and plot threads exactly and you know everything is in service of creating this holistic experience exactly like the script is great and the addition to it at the end with her actually writing the little women book also was fascinating and really felt very natural at the same time you can't talk about it without also thinking about the direction because Mm -hmm. the execution of the whole idea was what really made it come together we shouldn't forget the performances though the ensemble is really remarkable always love laura dern yeah the four kids were great I think my personal standout performance, if I had to pick one, would be Florence Pugh. Yeah, and her nomination for Supporting Actress was a big deal, too. Yes. I am really glad she got some recognition. Still slightly sad it wasn't for Midsummer, but actually, I think her performance in this was as good, if not better, just not quite as prominent. But nonetheless, she brings this incredible energy to that role. So dynamic, yeah. It's just a joy watching her reactions to things. She plays down to a 13-year-old, right, for, like, the little women parts. Yeah, those contrasts from her, like, trying to make it as an artist in France and kind of realizing that her dreams are all basically worth giving up because she's not good enough. And contrasting that with her, like, childlike mischief and glee was just... Obviously, Greta Gerwig seen a great potential in the story and her like acting performance. It's a team effort for sure, but she exactly. definitely helps bring a sense of continuity to that character that could have easily been missing because of that 
contrast between her past and present mm. or future yeah. or whatever you want to call it selves but it doesn't feel that way she feels like she is one character that really has grown and changed and she brings out both sides of that character incredibly well definitely um, and so does i'm not gonna saoirse this. ronan saoirse? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah she was probably my favorite aspect of the movie in terms of acting yeah she has been getting a lot of credit for it including a best actress nomination so Ooh. that is cool and well deserved and it's got hermione in it too <laughs> yes of course and the last person who i don't know the name of she didn't have as much to do yeah exactly um, she, she was, just dies she's pretty good though yeah she <laughs> spoiler alert yikes and bob odenkirk <laughs> yeah that was funny the also. most like why is he in this movie aspect of the movie but i nonetheless liked it exactly <laughs> he played it off well he was away for the war but he's also just a good father he's mm -hmm. a nice guy he is he's just a good dude he's just a good and dude. i mean he was the one that came up with the whole little women thing right he put that adjective and that noun together in his letter to them there you go so he exactly. coined the term ultimately this is a story of masculine triumph yes exactly <laughs> just kidding just kidding yeah uh, it's a wonderful wonderful movie and i called this actually my favorite movie of 2019 which even though we said it was kind of arbitrary and we shuffle them around a lot yeah i feel good calling this my favorite film of i the year. am so comfortable putting in my top five i ultimately went with parasite just because i've stuck with that since i saw it as mm. the best movie of the year and i've definitely considered bringing it down a significant amount but I just left it up there, because why not? It's why great. the hell not? Yeah. I think it was my number three. So we had some alignment, definitely, on our mm -hmm. lists. We yeah, we all had Parasite, Marriage Story, Little Women, Irishmen, all up in the top area. Right. And at least the top ten, I think. Definitely those, top right? ten. Almost top five, I think. What, we overlapped on 11, I think we said, of the movies yeah. that we had in our top 20? Yeah, I was really we... sad about not including Us, Queen and Slim, Dolomite is my name. Those were all like right on the cuff that I just had to leave out mm -hmm. because of the constraint of the top 20. And Those also, all... I wanted to include some other movies that we otherwise wouldn't have talked about. I ended up exchanging my number 20 for The Peanut Butter Falcon, which you should definitely see. It's a really good, like, feel good movie. That I think we actually have mentioned it before. We have mentioned it. I don't like, know brief, why we would have. Briefly. But anyway, we don't have to talk about it for very long. But Stop it's, talking about uh, it. it's just like a really cool and unique movie, despite. A lot of pretty cliched aspects. It's just like so enjoyable to watch mm. and good hearted and just gets all those good emotions. So Mitch told me it was really good too. So shout out to my man Mitch if you're listening mm -hmm. to this. I love you. So I'll have to watch that one for yeah. sure. Also Hustlers was also right outside my list. Mm. So that's another one that I think you should see. Also another big Oscar snub was Jennifer Lopez for Best Yeah, that actress, I though. think yeah, that was a she had a lot of talk for that. And she did. I'm really missed surprised. the domination. But anyway, for all our talk and criticism of the Oscars and all the discussion, which I agree with in large part, that it is out of touch and not diverse enough and panders to a very specific brand of Academy voter, my picks for my top five movies of 2019, four of them are Best Picture nominees. Yeah, so three I of them. Almost four were mine. Three so. and a half for court. Yeah. So... These are great movies, and I am happy that some of these are getting recognized. Definitely. Um, Corey, are there any on the Best Picture nominee list that you ardently don't think should have gotten nominated for Best Picture? Um, I agree that it was surprising that Jojo Rabbit got nominated, even though I don't disagree that it is probably good enough to get a nomination. Mm -hmm. I have Joker pretty low on my list. Actually, not low. It's kind of like medium. But I'm also not really surprised that that one's on there either. So honestly, like we had said initially, it's pretty straightforward, their choices. And they all yeah. kind of are understandable why they're on there. Yeah, Joker is an interesting case. I think it's probably the worst movie that's nominated. It's at least down there with Ford vs. Ferrari for me. But yeah, it's definitely the lowest on mine, I think. It's hard to see a world where Joker didn't get nominated for Best Picture. And I don't even know if that's a world we should wish for because it was such a divisive movie it provoked so much conversation when it came out mm -hmm. there were so many people that <clears throat> said it was terrible and yet it had all of this acclaim surrounding it from the very yeah. beginning and we mentioned in our podcast that it was kind of strange how much we did enjoy it considering how much we thought was just genuinely not good about it yeah that movie is very oblivious like thematically in terms of its social commentary yeah and... exactly we talked about that too i think yeah we had a big joker discussion 
where our whole question around it was, is Joker worth discussing? <laughs> our conclusion there was just that it had provoked enough thought and discourse and consideration of like big ideas in us to warrant discussion. I think that's the same reason that it belongs on this Oscar nominees list, right? It sparked like a similar level of outcry to something like Avengers Endgame or whatever in terms of the amount of people that watched that movie. And yet that discourse was a lot more interesting and divisive than the discourse about Avengers Endgame. So just because of the conversations that society has been having about this movie, it makes sense to have it up here. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not mad I about think it. so. I wouldn't honestly be shocked if it won either. But do you have a prediction for what's going to win? My best guess would be Marriage Story if it wasn't a Netflix original movie. Mm. Uh, we saw I Roma win a couple years ago. True, but not Best Picture. Right, Best Foreign Film. Right, I forgot. So I think there might still be some reservation about that. I also have that reservation, actually. I'm not sure if we're going to see a Netflix original winner. And for that reason... I think it's going to be one of 1917, Parasite, and Joker, just because 1917 feels like kind of the obvious pick. It's just got all the right ingredients. <laughs> Parasite, it's just universally enjoyable and recognizable as great enough that it might actually be able to sneak its way past Academy voters who like, you know, don't usually like films with subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's fair joker just because of the level of discussion there's been also had it not been netflix original irishman would have been a good choice good no. performances good yeah that's not my everything. picks that was just what i think yeah exactly yeah. exactly in terms of what i think will win i don't know for sure you don't yeah weirdly enough i don't uh, have a direct line into the voters uh, i could seen... see the irishman winning even though it is a netflix original mm. but i think that'd be unusual yeah it's possible that the pedigree of the white men involved in the Irishman will propel it to victory, if anything does. Yeah, The it's one I'd like to see movie. the most, obviously, the is Parasite, because it's my favorite movie of the year. But I honestly don't think it'll happen. I would love to see Parasite win, too, just because I loved it as well, and it would be awesome to see a non-American film win Best Picture. Yeah. I'd also love to see Little Women win, because it, it is just equally so Equally deserves it, yeah. <laughs> and Greta Gerwig, you know, was dishonored by not being nominated for Best Director, so... At least give her best picture. But also Greta Gerwig, the Oscars don't matter for shit. Don't let it get to you. Do you want to make a couple other predictions? Like some sure. best director, best actor, actor. Oh, you wanna yeah, you wanna make some predictions? I'm down. I'm down. Best actor, I would be shocked if Joaquin Phoenix doesn't win this one. Because his yeah, performance yeah, was so publicized. It's and just, just been... honestly it was really good. <laughs> it was really good. It was the best part about Joker, so Yeah. He was acting really hard, but uh God damn, if those laughs didn't make me feel more uncomfortable yeah. than I thought an actor was capable of making me feel. So wouldn't be mad about that. Although there are some great performances. Of the list. three that I've seen, I think Adam Driver also did a really good job. There was some meanness that came out of that, yeah, which I totally the... did not agree with. I thought he did really good. That it made me so mad because it was just a bunch of people who hadn't seen Marriage Story taking a scene totally out of context and trashing what was fantastic acting. And it was all just a big bandwagon of people who bought into it because everyone else told them that was bad acting and they were like oh they're yelling like anyway <laughs> i could go on about why i'm mad about that but it's not worth being mad about Ooh, this is an interesting one because didn't renee zellweger sorry we're moving on to actress <laughs> didn't renee zellweger win the golden globe for best actress yeah she did so that would make sense the golden globes are not often an accurate predictor though because the voting body is so small i know but at the same time it's kind of like you know it just makes sense for like hollywood choices you it know does. What i mean i would prefer saoirse ronan because we already talked about that yeah. but can't always get what you want right i'm gonna go ahead and predict uh saoirse saoirse saoirse, saoirse. saoirse ronan is yeah. it irish or something For, i think it's irish yeah. or something is it gaelic a thing anymore yeah it's a thing you just got to go to the right places are there any others we really want to predict here i mean i want to predict director, director i guess maybe? yeah i'm definitely predicting sam mendez here really? um i don't think it should be him but i think that this was such a flashy technical achievement, and the Academy is going to definitely give Best Cinematography to Roger Deakins and probably also yeah. give Best Director to Sam Mendes. I hope that it'll be Bong Joon-ho, because I'm positive he'll not get Best Picture oh, as yeah. a producer. I could see so him getting I Best Director. I think he could get Best Director. I would love to see that. The one that makes the most sense is probably Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. That was just very classically made. 
from a directing standpoint. You could also see him giving it to Scorsese. Right. <laughs> so it of could course, go anyway course. here, honestly. So we're going to call that our Oscar discussion. We didn't talk about everything, but we got a pretty good round table there. I, I think, think we talked about enough. Yeah. So, Corey, what were your favorite films of 2019 that were not nominated for an Oscar or for well, Best Picture? Well, my number one that was non-nominated for Best Picture was The Farewell, which we already talked about in one of our early episodes. Mm. But I think it's worth mentioning again that that is just a exceptional experience if you've never seen it. Mm-hmm. It was in my top ten, and I agree it's a wonderful, delicately made, evocative one of a kind movie yeah it really yeah the one of a kind thing i think too is very cool and I, there's actually a couple on here that i think are one of a kind as well i also included the souvenir and mm-hmm. the last black man in san francisco mm-hmm. which are kind of more under the radar films the last black man in san francisco is a film debut by joe talbot somebody to look out for i thought that was just an exceptionally made film that also kind of bordered on experimental a little bit, which I enjoyed. And then the one that definitely was extremely experimental that I liked was the souvenir, which was a film by Joanna Joanna Hogg, Hogg, who is a long time filmmaker. Exactly. And I've never seen any of her movies, but I've heard that they're very experimental. And I just saw in here that there's going to be a souvenir part two, which I, that doesn't really make sense, but. Oh, I saw that too. It's a just direct continuation of, the character's life (laughs) that's interesting and i mean it kind of is just like a slice of life almost of her Um, life really i think it is autobiographical it's autobiographical Mm -hmm. really okay well that makes it even more interesting because it really just hones in on the character's life so well and even with relatively minimal explicit dialogue about what she's thinking or feeling and, and what's going on it just really like hones in on what she is doing or what she's feeling over the course of the movie and how she's kind of changed over the course of it Mm -hmm. and also just how horribly attached she is into this relationship that is not healthy yeah i just thought it was fascinating a unique experimental film speaking of unique experimental films that you really liked about as high up on my list as you put souvenir on your list is waves oh yeah trey edward schultz yeah that's definitely the best trey edward schultz movie that i've seen I've only seen Cretia. <laughs> There's only three twos. Yeah. <laughs> it's also the best one I've seen, and I've only seen It Comes at Night besides that. Yeah. But talk about Raw. Uh, oh, yeah. Just gripping. Gripping and absolutely emotionally walloping intensity and also tragedy. I mean, it really hits a lot of different notes, and it just hits them all really hard. And I think maybe one criticism of it that I can see leveled at it is that it hits some of them too hard, and it just comes across as melodramatic. And for me, that was just part of the experience. Like, it is a melodrama, but it is, it just works so well. It I, really I'll does. And that. it's the amount of risks that he took there in terms of filmmaking choices, right? It could have been much more classically made. Yes. And instead took a lot of strange but very effective choices to make the movie what it was. And it really was a singular vision, which is the same case as movies like Cretia, and I don't know how it is for It Comes at Night. Definitely, that's another one that hits you somewhere deep and very unpleasant in the case of It Comes at Night. Yeah. But waves they're is a all more up definitely, and down experience. Uh, waves. Yeah, they're all definitely a little unpleasant at times. No. Cretia definitely has an edge of unpleasantness as well that ramps up towards the end, but the middle part of Waves, that one turning point moment, mm-hmm. so brutal and... Yeah unbelievable that that was even put in a movie Mm -hmm. two things to say about that first is the really cool aspect ratio change that happens at that Mm -hmm. moment just stood out to me right yeah it just just makes it so like claustrophobic yeah and it is like this sustained you know 10 or 15 minute sequence right in the middle of the movie that's like the transition from the first half to the second that's shot in that more claustrophobic lens right Mm -hmm. as the really horrifying traumatic thing happens (laughs) anyways the other thing i want to say about it is that I assumed that Trey Edward Schultz was black uh, while watching this just because it centers on a black family and like what seems like a very personal like African-American experience type thing. And then afterwards, when I found out he wasn't, and ever since then, it's made me like had to grapple with this movie in kind of a new way because I don't know. Yeah, it's like a white dude (laughs) directing a family that is all black kind of talking about 
blackness a little bit. A little bit. Like, it's not the main thing. It's like, definitely it's, not. Yeah, it's not so the main So it's good thing. that he didn't try and go all the way and make it like explicitly about race. Definitely. I did read some criticism that I didn't notice at the time that was about how the portrayal of the family is kind of straightforwardly about their blackness. Like the dad is kind of like, yeah, you got to work really hard and like everything you get, you got to earn. You yeah. don't, it's not just given to you. And that was interpreted, I guess, as just, portray- it, yeah, just a very cliched portrayal, I guess. Of a black father. Right? Yeah. And then there's also the potentially problematic fact that the young black male character ends up killing his girlfriend there i've seen criticism of this film that basically calls that out for being just a reinforcing of that stereotype that's a really Mm. unhealthy stereotype to continue to reinforce i don't know how to feel on that one simply because i felt so tremendously endeared to his character yeah i was just so involved in it that i didn't notice any like stereotype things at the time yeah because that like his character is so vividly sketched and you don't view him as just this violent young man at all you see all of these factors that are surrounding and that end up just breaking him and it you know it's so extreme it's incredible that a movie is able to make you watch a young man kill his girlfriend and yet feel like it practically was bound to happen with the confluence of factors that yeah i mean obviously he was a flawed person and fucked up really and, but bad. you <laughs> feel sorry for him instead of disgusted yeah right you feel so much and pity because of his character simultaneously appalled that he did that but not so much that he did it as that I mean, it is that he did it. I don't know. It's a very difficult thing to it's grapple with, though, right? It's and very well made. For exactly. Sure. That's what struck me so much about Waze, is that it felt so complicated. What is typically in films portrayed as <clears throat> a black and white affair. And I think part of it is just how intimately he gets into the characters. I mean, the first movie, Krisha, is actually, the cast is actually filled out by his family. It's mm. so low budget. He was able to turn his aunt, who is actually named Krisha, and an actress, turn her small acting career into a substantial role mm. as a intense character. And so I think working like with a close family element really showed on this movie even better yeah. because it just comes across as like you as the viewer are just right there with them. And the way it's filmed is just like, you're literally sitting there with them and having the conversation, being a part of the conversations that they have. Yeah. It really just, throws you into their lives like it's so deep into their lives and so you're so like you said closely involved with them that the cliches the possibly emotionally manipulative melodrama and the potentially you know problematic aspects none of them even occurred to me while i was in the theater watching it because of how engrossed i was even the attention grabby like soundtrack that I've seen criticized. That was criticized. I love the soundtrack. I thought the soundtrack was so cool. Like I <laughs> yeah. just love how loud it blared at you and how much it stood out. It was so different yeah. than how soundtracks are normally used in And movies. also woven together with a fair amount of good jarring original soundtrack, which I think was by the dude from Nine Inch Trent Reznor. Yeah, Trent yeah. Reznor. Totes. Totes uh, speaking of problematic though, one that I wanted to include that you did that I kind of wish I included, but at the same time I'm glad I didn't, is The Nightingale by Jennifer Kent, which is even more so, I would say, a affrontingly brutal experience. Yeah. Incredibly soul-crushing. Yeah, and in terms of the accuracy of its misogyny and racism, it's also kind of just, like, scary. Yeah. It's just a plane in a lot of ways. Like, it's shot pretty straight on medium shots like you're standing in the room with the characters kind of Mm -hmm. and it's set in this historical period that is just horrifically brutal in a lot of ways but sort of just it really is an affronting experience i loved it though i just thought it was so intense i liked it (laughs) and i thought it was better uh made in a lot of ways than the babadook but it's just so much It's hard to watch. Like, I've said this to people that I've talked to. Like, I honestly can't really even recommend it to people to watch because it's just so difficult. See, for me, though, it is very difficult at its peaks of difficulty, which, you know, we're probably talking about, like, the 
rape murder scene. <laughs> I don't know what other scene we would be talking, but yeah, like it up to that point in the movie, it gradually ramps up the this is horrible. I can't believe I'm watching this moments until it gets to just the ultimate. This is the most horrible fucking thing I've like ever watched in a movie level stuff in that in what is basically the inciting incident of the movie, right? Mm-hmm. And then the rest of the film, there are definitely brutal parts, but it's much more about the stark, cold tale of revenge that yeah. unfolds. And, and that, I think also just like the commentary on her own country's colonialism. Totally. So. Loved the, I don't remember anyone's names, but the side character who was the native, the Australian native. Don't, don't know. Their dynamic was so warm, ultimately. Or I mean, I don't know. You just, I loved the relationship that their characters had. And even though it was tragic in a lot of ways on both of their parts and was obviously incredibly fucked up, like a lot of what they went through together and separate, they felt like such vividly sketched people, even though they were put into what you could consider a typical revenge movie setup where like people do X horrible thing to the main character. And then they spend the whole rest of the movie just trying to go kill the people that did that thing to them. Everything else about the Nightingale though was so thoughtful and the characters were like elegantly portrayed. The historical time period was vivid and uncompromisingly gritty in its depiction. And the, relevance in terms of its portrayal of sexual violence at a time when you know the me too movement is fresh on our minds and that whole way of just the fact that that social issue is very relevant right now right sexual violence and rape culture so it just felt like it was the revenge movie for our time it turned Mm -hmm. a lot of the cliches Mm -hmm. pretty plainly on their heads and that's why i loved it yes we can agree on that some other ones that we can agree on that are on both of ours on a cursory glance, it looks like is The Lighthouse, which we talked about. Yes, got a whole episode. Uh, Midsummer, which I think we could do a whole episode on. We totally could. Um, Uncut Gems and Toy Story 4. Mm-hmm. All really good movies. Yeah. Yes, of various different kinds of movies. Yeah. There. We could just continue having individual discussions about each of these movies. Midsummer. Wish we had talked about it in our horror episode. Um, I know, we missed out we did. on that. I honestly kind of just want to rewatch it at this point and then do a full-fledged episode it's, about it. <laughs> it's probably out on DVD, you know, rental by now. Yeah, it totally is. Maybe we should just do that. Yeah. It's so good. Ari Aster is great. Yeah, he is. Uncut Gems. You want to speak to that? Also exceptionally directed and performed. A very unique experience. You <laughs> mentioned when we first talked about it that was something that was totally true, that the exciting ending is just watching a basketball game and it totally works like there's just so many unusual choices put into the main character howard i think played by adam sandler and put into the whole direction of the movie that just works so well and it's just kind of unusual in that fact that it's kind of a tough watch it's just not very conventionally made and yet everything just fit together. So it's nice. so propulsively compelling, uh, mm-hmm. even though it's unusual, right? Yeah. And very talky. From the opening There's, frame, yeah. it is not what you expect it to be. <laughs> it's and, hilarious yeah. and intense and The dramatic. characterization of his gambling addiction, basically, is so powerful as well. Like He seems so on top of everything, and the choices he makes throughout the movie just get increasingly worse and worse Mm -hmm. and it's just so cringy and yet so compelling to watch yeah interesting like you definitely i've seen one uh, negative review that you know said i got too annoyed with his character to like this movie like basically and you are frustrated with it. it's a frustrating movie yeah i wouldn't say annoying but frustrating it's frustrating but it's like the kind of frustrating where you just need to see how much more frustrating it can get i mean the moment where it all kind of resolves, and he has everything settled and even has the money in hand to give to the yeah. uh, loan sharks, basically, that are pursuing him. And he goes to make the biggest bet of the movie. It's just so <laughs> painful and exciting and thrilling and like frustrating to watch. Or, uh, like, for me, I at that point couldn't help but like almost laugh. Yeah, just no, because exactly. Of but how ridiculous yeah, it is, right? Like, yeah. 
And then for me, the ultimate cathartic moment was when he gets killed at the very end, where <laughs> I laughed at that moment, not because it was goofy in and of itself or like because I was trying to mock the movie at all. Like I just thought it was funny because, you know, the whole movie is about his climb to this destination that it seems can be nothing other than death because – like you said, his decisions just get worse and worse and more and more dangerous. And then the movie's final reversal or just like, I don't know, great ingenuity is like, yeah, he gets yeah. exactly what he's because like, he <laughs> succeeded in what he wanted. Yeah. And he died at his peak. Then get killed. Yeah. It's a kind of a happy ending in a certain twisted way. Yeah. Because he won. He did the big, he got a big win. Uh -huh. Got the big win. He I don't did. know what to think of it, but it, yeah, I just crazy bummer of a snub for sure yes but, for sure but um, you know it's the kind of movie that is too weird to win an oscar at least as long as the voting system yes. for the oscars stays how it is right now i want to mention one that you have not seen oh but before that i still think ad astra super good mm, that, and i still I think knives like out also was good mm. and worth putting on there. i mean i was that was almost in my top 20 true but the one that you haven't seen that you should is i think it's double v in French, nonfiction, the English title, it is on Hulu, and it's by a dude who's made a lot of random French movies, uh, Olivier Asias. Some of his recent ones, if you recognize these, are Personal Shopper, mm, Clouds yeah. of Silmaria, Something in the Air, Carlos, and Summer Hours. They all got, looks like, nominations and awards on all of those. So. <laughs> some kind of award Some kind of awards. Personal Shopper got it, can Best Director, so... That's on, been on my Netflix list for a while. I oh, I didn't it know it was on Netflix. Uh, apparently, that's a psychological thriller. Oh, yeah, that's the one with Kristen Stewart. That's right. She's also in Clouds of Sil Maria as a side character. Anyway. Uh, nonfiction, though, is a comedy. And a very weird comedy because it's pretty much just a classic sex comedy where the main character is sleeping around and at the same time having these high intellectual conversations that are all based around like the publishing world of the high level Paris community. Huh. <laughs> the same time informed by the main character who writes in a style that in the movie they call auto fiction that is obviously about his life. And yet he calls it fiction basically. So it's like a weird balance of, commenting on reality and fiction and like the nature of publishing and books and literature in a digital world so there's a lot of like great intellectual conversation amid a funny weird you know situation with a lot of great characters that are all huh. having sex with each other <laughs> well you know what one of my new year's resolutions was to get more on my foreign film game that'd be a good one to start with i think i think i uh, i think i will it's very entertaining. We get better every year. It'll give you a chuckle, I think. A chuckle is all I'm looking for. <laughs> and Juliette Binoche, who's in a lot of his movies, she was also in Clouds of Silmaria as the main character. She's great. Okay. Well, since you called that one out, I'll call it a call. Oh, you already mentioned, I guess, Toy Story 4. I don't want to talk about it, but <laughs> damn, good, it was really one. sad and good. I like Toy Story. We both p also um, put A Hidden Life on ours. I just saw. Yeah. Hidden Life. Very long uh, movie <laughs> it is kind of an exhausting experience and yet by the end of it it feels like it needed to be an exhausting experience terrence malick still has got some it turns out yeah an underrated catalog for sure and um an under noticed movie totally yeah. shut out from any awards season mm -hmm. consideration really but i mean they're just difficult like the last one he did also got very poor reviews uh, yeah. not that hidden life got poor reviews because it got good reviews knight of cups you mean Knight of Cups, yeah. I've uh, The one New Yorker guy, Richard Brody, who I follow because he's kind of this interesting in just how intellectual his reviews mm -hmm. are and always try to be. He really liked Knight of Cups, too. <laughs> and there he put go. The Dead Don't Die as his number one movie. <laughs> yeah. number, not number one, but up there. Anyway, you mentioned Quinn and Slim, but I'll throw that one back in there. I liken it to The Nightingale in that it is uh, a, on the surface, simple twist on a classic archetypal subgenre that has kind of been done to death in this case the couple crime duo started by bonnie and clyde basically and this is in some ways an overt homage to that the title <laughs> is an overt homage to that for sure 
it isn't perfect. It's a little uneven, but wonderful characters, a pair of incredible central performances, and one of those movies that kind of comes together and coalesces at the end into something really impactful that makes you not mind the road bumps so much. Mm-hmm. That's and kind a little of bit of heavy-handedness, but it's yeah. easy to overlook because it's a good movie. Same with Dolomite, actually. I had a lot of flaws. I really didn't dig into its title character at all as a human being, mm-hmm. um, and yet such a vivid portrayal of a historical moment and some really joyous and incredibly entertaining, laugh-out-loud funny, but also like in a very warm and meaningful way. Yeah, exactly. Way. I think I mentioned this on our Netflix podcast episode, but it's just like a reverent portrayal mm-hmm. for a character that's not considered, you know, a very lovable human. It was a long overdue biopic, I think, totally. for that character in terms of his influence and how much he contributed to a lot of different future art projects. Yeah. Like they it say at the end of the movie that he was very influential in the start of rap music and a very singular comedian. And also Eddie Murphy is good. Yeah, of course. As Rudy Ray Moore himself. Ah. <sighs> well, well we could go on, right? Yes. We could keep doing this i've got my entire 2019 ranked on my letterbox page if anyone wants to <laughs> search me up on there there you go at isaac candleman i'll have but, to update mine yes but we're thinking of posting some more best of 2019 content in time for oscar season on our blog mm-hmm. that's about movies com. and i think i feel good about this as the audio component even though yeah. We didn't necessarily touch on every possible thing we could Definitely have. Definitely missed a couple, but it's totally fine. Yeah. How can you possibly so many movies. summarize a year in yeah in an hour? We did a goddamn good job, though. <laughs> Better job than the Oscars, though. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. Am I right? Yeah. There should be just like 400 nominations for everyone because they all deserve better. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah, it's true. <laughs> no. And different That's an exaggeration. Cases. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff out there. It's hard to boil it down to a scant five choices. Yeah. True that. But- since we have tried to do that, what do you think of our thoughts? Do you I thought disagree? Our thoughts were good. Oh, I know you oh. thought our thoughts were good. I'm asking <laughs> the other people here, that totally including our studio head. audience yeah. and anyone listening to this. I'm curious to hear more thoughts related to our thoughts. So, me too. If you got them, share them. We are on social media at About Movies CI, yeah. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Hit us up. Hit us up. Sorry if we spoiled a lot of movies. It already happens. It already Sorry happens. About that. There's no going back <laughs> in time. We've done it on every episode so far. Yeah, so this one was probably our space. most movies spoiled, though. Yes. Award. New record. We knew. Keep new track. Record. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just remember there's a study done once that I read about. I don't remember I also that about how you enjoy time. movies more when they've been spoiled for you for some weird psychological reason. But that's probably bullshit. Probably just because you have more to anticipate and it doesn't. I don't know. It doesn't. And we don't have a I way to know. like empirically represent enjoyment, though. So yeah, like, exactly. How I don't know. How do you measure that? I don't know. Anyway, hope that that's true because uh, you're about to really enjoy a lot of movies if it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, check out our list on the blog if you haven't already. I would recommend any of our top twenty. Thanks for listening and thanks for caring about our opinions mm-hmm. or not caring stuff. about our opinions, yeah. but just wanting to hear our thoughts. Yep. Look out for more content coming soon. Oh, yeah. Gonna We're get back. It going. We're, We're back. getting the going. All right. Peace out, everybody. Happy 2019, Bye. 2020. Hope the movies are good. Bye.